We're downtown Rockford at J.R. Cortman Center for Design. Hi, I'm Doc Slavkowski, and this is the Art Zone. We'll talk with Rockford artist Bob Belt. After that, we'll go backstage at New American Theater and talk with some of the creative minds behind set design and costume design. And then we'll see an art music video from Cradle Ground. And in between, some poets from the poetry reading at, held at Cafe Esperanto. Did you in, in grade, yeah, in grade school and in high school, I, uh, I always liked art, but never really took it seriously. I mean, I could copy a picture better than anybody in my class and stuff like that, but I never took it seriously. And after working as a computer programmer for a few years, decided I've got to do something else. And I went out and bought some paints and started painting it and found that I really, really enjoyed it and really missed it without even realizing it. So there was actually a point where you said, I've got to do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, hit a, I hit a breaking point where I was in college and I didn't know what I was going to do. I had already quit my job as a programmer to go to school, didn't know what I was doing, and I just like, got to do something. So I decided that I would start doing art again, see what happened. The, the first ones I did were, were more passive. Uh, they were calmer, I would say, when I first started out. And, was more concerned about which colors look looked right together and you know which ones look nice together and, and as, as time gone on, has gone on I just kind of just do whatever I think looks good at the time and don't concern myself as much with what other people think. And what is it this is I know maybe even an unfair question a really tough question but I still would like to hear your response to it. What is it that makes you an artist? What is it that makes me an artist? <laughs> Um, I don't know, maybe just by going with, with you know, gut instincts, just um, letting go with, um, with what you're supposed to do or what you're not supposed to do, with um, all the patterns that you've been brought up with and enforced to conform to. If you can remove those and get in touch with your, you know, the, the essence of yourself, I guess, um, it makes you you know, your source of creativity. And, and I like to I like to think that when I'm painting that, that I can get that I do get in touch with that. Do you see yourself as an artist or as someone working in computers that does yeah. artwork on the yeah. side? That's, that's what I'm hoping to do is take some uh, computer graphic computer graphics classes while I'm in uh, school and hopefully be able to do, you know can't bank on making a living as a painter because that's just, you know, it's, it's, it's as tough as being a rock star, so. But is that, that is there a little bit of that in you? I mean, like that little bit as far as the dream goes? Oh, or? yeah, yeah. I, would, I mean, I would love to be able to just be a, you know, be a painter and that's it. Even if I had a measly existence, if I could make enough money to get by and enjoy painting, you know, enjoy what I'm doing, then, then I'd love to do that. If only the girl next door. Lower, lower, lower. Who are Lois? Who are yes, yes, yes? Your cranium um, um, is driving me insane. Um, 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 your teeth are too sharp. Um, 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 I think I'll die you by you dentures. By God, um, 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 loving in the Lord. Levels, levels, levels. Makes the cheese drink. Oh, Level for my skyscraping level, level. Higher, dreaming, hover, higher, dreaming, hum. <laughs> I think when you go to the director too, and whatever you do, and no matter how many meetings you have, you could say um, you could you're trying to get a look for the whole show. 
whether it be costumes or scenery. And in the scenic element, it's like you're trying to tell, you're trying to um, push across a feeling for the show. Um, is the you know, is the sofa, does it have a sweeping back so somebody could drape over it and it would look really pretty, you know, and you give, you give all that input so that when he goes to rehearsal, he has something too to work with. And the actors have something to work with because of choice is why you made choices. Um, starting with reading the script and meeting with the director, it's almost the same as costume design to, to, to meet the needs of the production. Do we need, how many doors do we need? What kind of furniture pieces do we need? Then we go into like colors of the set and construction of the set, how, you know, how the layout is, the ground plans, um, so that it, you basically have to deal with the actors and their footwork at this point and, um, and how the director might be blocking uh, and putting the show together. Do the doors open in, do the doors open out? You know, that kind of thing. Um, how many steps are there for them to walk up, and where does it reach on the stage level? That kind of, that kind of thing. So your your first meeting would be with the director of the show. Um, yes, after you've done some preliminary work, and said, "Here's a floor plan I'm thinking of. This is a this is the background that I'm thinking of," and then meeting with him and seeing what his requirements might be. But you always go to you always go to the director a little bit prepared with some ideas, you know. So you read the play? Definitely read the play. <laughs> read the play many times, dozen times, you know. As you go along, you break things down, you take things apart, you decide, I don't want this, I do want that, what colors things are gonna be. This, These colors were sort of, I, I picked colors from, um, the hotel is supposed to be somewhere in France, and I picked a, a southern region in France, and. Um, used some of their colors like the oranges of stuccos and green and they put to they put colors together brilliantly like um like where van gogh painted and you could see how the colors are amazing i mean so we we picked those colors and there are many people behind what goes on on stage there's a lot of people who put it together and a designer which will consider me a designer <laughs> is an artist when it all comes together as a whole work, um, when the actors do their work, when when the people who make the clothing does their work, or the people who build the sets, people who paint it, then then it's a total piece of art. Then it then it works. So the next step after the sketches is what? Um, and everything is approved by the director and everyone else. Um, we go into, in scenic design, then we go in, the, the uh, scene shop will cost everything, order thing, order the lumber, um, decide, is it made out of wood, is it made out of steel, is the woodwork made out of styrofoam and molded and cut. Um, for instance, uh, upstairs on this show, on Private Lives, they did all the balustrades out of styrofoam and did them on a lathe kind of thing and just carved them out because I wanted very curved and graceful balustrades and that took a while but styrofoam doesn't hold an actor up when they want to sit on this railing so they had to do metal struts underneath it and they had to figure all that out and how to put it together so you allow for someone else to take your design and make it work right and they they um institute they what is the they create it then particular set revolves and moves and um he came up with those working pieces all i said was like I would like to see something slide off. I would like to see something move on. And that's what he that, comes up the with. The fact that the set does revolve, was that your decision? Or is that your idea? Let me say not necessarily your decision. It's an right? idea, and it's an idea I used before. Um, but I mean, as far as particularly using that idea yeah. with this show. Yeah, that you decided was. that the, the, the set would revolve. Right. So they right. wouldn't have to reset it up again. Yes, but however, just because the set revolves, it doesn't mean that we get the whole scene out with just one revolve. Once the set revolves, it creates the next act, but they still have to bring furniture on because we couldn't make the revolve as big to carry the whole room because on our stage, it doesn't work that way because of our three quarters, you know, our thrust and how the audience sits. It doesn't always work to get a whole revolve around with all the furniture, with all the things you need.
it is like a, like you said like a like a symphony of a visual symphony um and it involves so much it involves all kinds of technical things that people don't think about like how does the sound work and how many hours the hours that we spent on doing a light cue with a sound cue and moving a piece of furniture or a piece of scenery the hours that it takes and nobody might know it but that's what we do we spend hours so, in on a day also once the set is constructed do you work with the lighting people do they ask you things like uh, lighting people or do you kind of let them just do their thing with it um they do their thing and they get plans and they get color swatches and they know that this wall is going to be blue or pink or whatever um they come up with what the show requires lighting wise they get here and they start doing things um and then you work with them um, for both costumes and scenery, you work with them when they get here. You might have a call, a couple calls before they actually arrive on site, um, discussing certain lights. They get here and then they try to make everything look wonderful. And actually, that is the icing. <laughs> that is the icing. And um... well, John has presented me with uh, sketches that relay visual concepts of the show for Private Lives, for Noel Carl's Private Lives. And what I have to do is to do the technical drafting of the piece to make sure that it'll fit and work on the New American Theater stage. We only have a 32-foot a, a wide proscenium opening and only 22 feet downstage of our plaster line or the proscenium wall and so many feet upstage of that. So I have to take these visual concepts or these sketches and uh, make them fit and make them work on the stage. I also have to uh, give guidance to the carpenters and the technical director and how it's all going to operate and how it's all going to move. Um, Private Lives is a two-set show, meaning it takes place in two locations. So in Act 1, we needed uh, to have the balcony of a hotel, and in Act 2, we needed to have somebody's apartment, which meant we had to have a totally different look. Um, what we've done is we've come up with a revolve in order to handle that. Um, the model in front of me is just a mock-up of the show. And we do a model in scale just to make sure that it's all going to fit and it's all going to work. So in Act 1, we have our, our uh, hotel balcony here, two French door units, um, and our balcony rail and things like that. These things, at intermission, will track off to stage right, and then this one will track off all the way to stage left. And once those are gone, then the entire unit can spin on a center pivot point using casters underneath the revolve. And we have all of the walls for Act 2. And so my function is to try to fit it all in, make it look real, meaning I wouldn't want a doorway that's too short for the actor, um, and then do all the drafting on the piece so that the carpenters have something to build from. These are uh, the drawings on the show, and they're done in half-inch scale. And uh, from this, they build the flats, walls, doors, turntable. Mr. Sullivan's approach to his work is to create a team of artists that work together, and that certainly includes the designers and the draftsperson um, and so I'm in, in constant communication with, with Mr. Cardo and our scene shop here. Uh, he may come up with a new idea, or let's say that uh, uh, a certain material isn't available to us locally, or it's too expensive to bring it in from uh, out of state or something like that. So we might have to adapt the design as we go. The director is involved way before day one, way before day one. He sets the tone or she, he or she sets the tone of the piece. And working with the designer, he may something say something to the designer like, okay, I know that we need to have all these doors, but yet I, I wanted to have a light and open feel. I want these characters to have a very free environment. Um, so the director doesn't usually speak in concrete terms like six doors, six doorknobs, you know. Um, He's, he speaks in, in very uh, um, abstract or conceptual terms. 
we get what we call renderings, and um, basically it's a it's a design that that John comes up with, or the design the costume designer. Um, this is the way most of most designers work, and it's been approved by the director, and uh, it's something that obviously is is right. Um, period wise and um, if we know who the actor or actress is we make sure that uh, John tries to make sure that that's the most flattering that that he can come up with for that particular person and um, then the director will look at it and either approve it or, or say this is too long I'd like this shorter whatever it's like a blueprint in a way um, and then um, uh, now, some designers don't work with renderings. They just work with photographs, especially if they're doing a later show, like a contemporary show. Some designers will work that way. But um, mostly John works with renderings. And then, um, and then after we, the renderings have been approved, and um, then we go out and do what we call swatching, which is uh, looking for the fabrics and um, trying to find the fabrics that are going to look good and, um, of course, fit into the, uh, the budget. <laughs> Very important part. Do you operate all of the machinery in here? Familiar with it all? Yes. Yeah. I have to. Well, I have to be because sometimes we have people come in um, that maybe will just be working in the shop for a few days. So if they don't know how to use it, I have to kind of give them a crash course. And not only do I have to know how to use them, I have to know how to maintain them and fix them when they break. So well, my my general title is costume shop manager, and that's base that's basically my my full title. I always I always do that, but I I do work a lot with the designers. I'm I'm sort of the liaison between the designer and the theater because I work with them on making sure that they have what they need, that they um, stay within the budget, that they have the workers that they need because we don't have a staff. I'm, this is a one-person operation. And so when we do a show, for example, like Christmas Carol, which has a lot of things that are being built, um, then we need, a, we need a much bigger staff in here. So I have to hire the uh, the appropriate amount of people to come in and, and do this for us. A show like, for example, Steel Magnolias, um, that's more of a contemporary show. So that'll be a heavy, what we call just a shop and buy type of show. Or we also have a, um, an immense costume stock upstairs in the theater. And so a lot of times we go through and we can pull a lot of things that we have up there. We, over the years, we've accumulated um, some wonderful period pieces and um, we have a, a lot of things to choose from. So between the combination of those, um, that's how we, we get the end result of what we're going to use on stage. We, we, all ha we all pitch in and do a little bit of sewing. My main job is to make sure that um, everybody has what they need to get the job done. Um, and I usually don't really pitch in until towards the end. Or I might, if we have a job that might be a little tedious, something that is very time consuming, I'll do that because I can be, I can, be spared. I don't need to be sitting at the machine. But I miss that. I miss I miss the the actual putting the pieces together. And there's nothing more exciting than than looking at a rendering and then taking a pile of fabric and putting it together. And then in a week that that pictures come to life. It's it's just very exciting. Here I sit, smoking and goofing, invariably stealing words from him, as I steal his breath, dead since 69, however never dead, never more alive, his breath my inspiration and passion. I suck his life from his erotic grave soil, and I feel his sex, lovely, his voice slurred, the slur of my penciling page, but I also feel his, my breath, thick labor and stinking, and life spiraling down low, the revulsion of flesh, then my pencil slows silent typewriter and stationary paper roll. Dead on the paper, October, t October 12th, but an immortal collection of him not buried so much of my effort.
Father, why have you always forsaken me? 